Next on the Broadway show, the triumph of the tragedy. You'll hear from the stars of the new film, The Tragedy of Macbeth, including Denzel Washington. Plus, Tick Tick Boom explodes on the big screen and on Netflix. We're talking to Andrew Garfield and Lynn manuel Miranda. Phantom Thread. We'll talk to the two women who play Christine in Broadway's Phantom of the Opera. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is The Broadway Show. So glad you could be here for this totally jam-packed episode of The Broadway Show. I'm Tamsin Fidel. By the pricking of my thumbs, something wicked this way comes. My husband. King that shall be. If we should fail. We fail. It's award season in Hollywood, and some of this year's most celebrated films have their roots in live theater, none more so than the tragedy of Macbeth. It's director Joel Cohn's Shakespeare adaptation, starring Francis McDormand and Denzel Washington. We heard from the stars, including Denzel. We rehearsed the, 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 the film like it was a play. We sat around a table. Uh, we stood the play up on its feet. We, 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 we did the blocking like you almost like you would block out a, a play. And it was all shot on sound stages. So they, it, it was like being on stage, you know, because it was the, because lighting and, 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 and sets had a, a lot, everything to do with it. I mean, it was like we were moving from one set to another. So it was like small one act plays. I mean, my first day I was doing a costume fitting and I just went over to say, hey, you know, to Denzel and Fran and Joel and, you know, <laughs> exchanging pleasantries. Next thing I know, we were up on our feet, you know, just just kind of walking around the room saying, speaking, speaking the text. And and that was fun. It was we were already sort of off to the running. And, and you know, Denzel always said, you know, and, and, and I've always heard heard this growing up is like, stay ready so you don't have to get ready. So, you know, we were in that room playing and then everybody sort of came in and became a company. We were reading each other's lines and just vibing off of each other. And um, and I think that made for, you know, by the time we got to the shooting process, it was butter. Things without all remedy should be without regard. What's done is done. We have scorched the snake, not killed it. Obviously seeing Denzel and Fran working their way up to those performances, they are not you cannot do Shakespeare and, you know, turn up on the first rehearsal or first reading of it kind of fully ready to go. It's, it's, it needs to be sort of dragged into yourself from somewhere. Um, and getting to see that was an incredible privilege. There's such deep thinkers about it and are so specific and so passionate and so collaborative and open and they were just amazing. Francis is brilliant, you know, and, and powerful and, and, and obviously very talented and, and as is our entire cast, you know, it was really, uh, I think us, Joel and Francis and I got a lot of energy from the, from the younger actors and actresses and what they were bringing to the table. Of all men else I have avoided thee, but get thee back. My soul is too much charged with blood of thine already. Joel sort of had his own, uh, he sort of puts his own spin on it. You know, he's, he's, uh, but it, but also Shakespeare is sort of Cohen-esque before the Cohens were the Cohens, and you know this, they, they sort of speak the same language. And so um, to be able to to watch him sort of put the pieces together was just extremely fascinating. Another film getting Oscar buzz is Tick, Tick, Boom, directed by Lin-Manuel Miranda. It's available right now on Netflix. The movie stars Andrew Garfield, who's already been nominated for a SAG award and is considered one of the Oscar frontrunners. Paul Wontora caught up with Lynn and Andrew. Hello. Hi. Welcome. I'm Jonathan Larson. This is a beautiful film and a beautiful performance. Congratulations. How does it feel to see the, the finished product, to see what you guys pulled off? 
God, it's really overwhelming, I'm not gonna lie. This, this one is very, very special to all of us, and um, I'm no exception. I feel so connected to this piece, so connected to John and to Lynn and to this whole company, and I'm so proud of Lynn. I'm so grateful to him that he had the, the courage to take this on and the, the kind of insanity to, to bring us all along for the ride. Like, I feel like Jonathan is smiling. I do feel that he, you know, he's, he's happy with what we've done. He, he was always our North Star. And, uh, you know, our attitude for the whole thing was to let him come through, let him l lead us and guide us in a, you know, kind of mystical, spiritual way. And we felt him so strong. I, we, I feel him right now as we talk, you know, he, he was such a profound artist and he changed musical theater forever. And he's created ripples in people. You know, there, we, there may not be a Lin-Manuel Miranda if it wasn't for John Larson. What was the most fascinating thing about his story that you learned? Yeah, well, it was like Lynn was introducing me to a long lost brother that I didn't know I, 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 I had or existed. So what, one of the things I love about John is that he made everything an occasion. You see it in the Boho Day sequence in the film. It's like, you know, he wants to keep the party going and like everything's an event. Like no, nothing is ordinary. It's all a celebration of this moment. And he, he was someone that I think had an acute awareness of the shortness of life. He was so sensitive, he's so tender, his heart was always on his sleeve and his skin was translucent and, and so thin. He felt all of the wounds of the world so personally. And that was what enabled him to be the artist that he was and to write this kind of opus and this love letter to his community. You know, there were so many aspects that we needed to honor. And I, I really, we, we definitely worked as hard as we could to do that. I work at the Moondance Diner. Check. One sec. Do we take reservations? No, we do not take, we're, we're a diner. There are so many um, beautiful, memorable uh, moments and location shoots. Is there any, any uh, specific days on set that really stand out for you? Oh yeah, I mean, I, it, what I, where I immediately go is the Delacorte in Central Park and singing Why at the piano solo live, you know, it was really important that that was live. We were, I wanted to get at least a few takes that were clean and, and live and raw and vulnerable because it was a, a really important emotional um, crossroads for John where, he, where, where he's trying to figure out how to move through this terrible moment of loss and devastation and grief. And uh, of course, he figures it out at the piano. He figures it out with, his, with, his, with, with a song and a tender one at that. So that one, you know, the, the magic of that night and the second take, we got it. What do you feel when you see uh, the actual footage of Jonathan? There's some great video of him actually performing Tick, Tick, Boom. And I know you recreate some of those moments, but when you, when you see the footage of him, what are the emotions? It's really moving. It's deeply overwhelming to, to, to think that I, I get to have a, a spot in, 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 a, in the attempt to honor such a, an incredible artist, someone who, who is so profoundly life-changing for musical theater and for so many other musical theater artists, Lynn included, you know, to, to, to feel like I, I have a chance to honor that person and to um, give him more life, yeah, for, to, to quote Tony Kushner, uh, that is the most profound gift that I get to, to be a part of. And as we mentioned, this is Hamilton creator Lin-Manuel Miranda's directorial debut. Paul also caught up with Lynn. I love that you um, chose Tick, Tick, Boom for your first uh, feature film as a director. Obviously, you, you have a lot of opportunities coming your way, and it's really meaningful to know that you chose something uh, that that is so special to you. Yeah, well, Rosa Stevens said to Jonathan, write what you know. Um, and if I know anything, it's that Jonathan Larson paved the way for me to have a life in this business. Um, in the Heights and Hamilton don't exist without Rent being the trailblazing force that it is with bringing contemporary music to the Broadway stage, with bringing the most diverse cast I'd ever seen to a Broadway stage. All of the lessons from Rent are, are things that I, are theses that I advanced in my work because that was the show that made me feel like I could write a musical one day. There are so many Broadway stars, Broadway songwriters, Broadway producers in this movie. It was so exciting to watch that. How important was it to you to sort of um, bring the whole community into this movie? Yeah, a lot of the things that people consider Broadway cameos, I didn't consider cameos. I just 
I know how good theater actors are and I want to work with them. So of course I'm gonna hire Laura Benanti to be in a focus group scene because she's gonna make whatever we wrote 50 times funnier um, and think of 50 things we haven't thought of. Um, but to, to, the, to the point of um, the, the Sunday sequence, which you know I will try to talk about without spoilers, um, that's Jonathan's homage to Sondheim Sunday in the Park with George. And John only ever heard it with himself singing alone, maybe Roger Bart singing back up behind him. Um, but that's it, it was like a two-man band. And I wanted John to have this galaxy brain moment where it's not just the legends uh, that he grew up loving and people from shows that he watched uh, growing up, but also glimpses of future shows that I know were influenced by Jonathan Larson. One is mine, uh, one is a uh, uh, Janine Tesori show, um, and, um, and even future collaborators of Jonathan that the 1990 John hasn't met yet. Coming up, we'll talk to the two women who play Christine in Broadway's Phantom of the Opera. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is The Broadway Show, and we'll be right back. Phantom of the Opera is Broadway's longest running musical, but Andrew Lloyd Webber's masterpiece is making history once again. Here's Paul Wontorek with the story. Thanks, Tamsin. These angels of music are sharing an iconic Broadway part. Megan Pacerno is once again Christine Daae in The Phantom of the Opera, joined by newcomer Emily Coachu as an alternate in the role, making her the first black actress to play the part on Broadway. I met up with the talented ladies at the Renaissance Hotel's Our Lounge. Megan, let me start with you. Okay. You were performing in Phantom yes. when Broadway shut down. Yes. So you've been without Christine Daae, wishing you were somehow here again. Yes. She is. How does it feel? It's a little surreal. I'm like, like cautiously positive about everything. I don't yes. want to get too excited yet, but it feels amazing. Um, I mean, we're making history. Yeah. Uh, Team Christine is making history right mm -hmm. now. Team and Christine. We are historically returning. I mean, Phantom's never been shut down like this before, so it's it's quite a time to be alive, and it's amazing to be back. I'm I'm gonna cry a lot. <laughs> there is a Team Christine. That is a thing. There are a lot of amazing actresses mm -hmm. who have uh, played this role, Christine Daae in Phantom of the Opera. How does it feel to be joining their ranks, joining the club? I mean, it's surreal. I just I feel so grateful. Um, this has been like a dream of mine for a long time. It's actually the first show I ever saw on Broadway, so this is kind of full circle for me, and it's special because I get to step into this role as the first black woman to play it. I've gotten already a few messages from girls who are younger than me who are like, I'm coming to see Phantom because of you, and like, that's really special for me because, I mean, I, mean, I just think that theater should be for everyone. This role has always been split between two actresses since mm -hmm. it first opened on Broadway. So you do six shows a week, and you do two shows a week, mm -hmm. and you share the same dressing room. Mm -hmm. So are there any, how does that work? I mean, you've been through this before. Are there certain rules about the space? It is definitely a team, Christine. <laughs> um, so I had never replaced ever before in my life, and I was very lucky that um, my alternate at the time, Erin LaCroix, was just the sweetest. And she like took all her stuff down, and she's like, girl, this is your dressing room. We'll share this and that. Um, it has been cleaned, but you should know that usually it's like a fairy threw up <laughs> in my room. Okay. So I like fairies. Unicorn and lots of lights. Seth always, Seth is our resident director and always comes in and he's like, oh my god, there's more in here? <laughs> I'll try to keep it, I don't know, we'll see. Maybe I'm a changed person post-pandemic. Live theater is back in New York City and all across the country. We want to tell you about two of our great touring shows. Coming up in just a sec, an inside look at My Fair Lady. Tickets on sale now. But first, the Tony-nominated play, What the Constitution Means to Me, is coming to a city near you. And now Broadway alum Cassie Beck takes over the new production. Charlie Cooper caught up with the star of this fantastic show. Heidi Shrek's What the Constitution Means to Me bowed on Broadway right here at the Helen Hayes Theater. Now the tour is relaunching and hitting the road with Cassie Beck as its leading lady. I got a chance to talk with her. 
first and foremost, what are you most nervous about coming back to Broadway after such a long pause? All of it. <laughs> I'm nervous about all of it, to be honest. I'm so glad you said it that way too, because I was gonna say, if you asked me what I was excited about, I was gonna have to say, well, I'm trying to turn my nerves into excitement because it is also excitement. And I'm I'm hoping that all that muscle memory is there and I still know what to do, but I'm excited about um, the connection, honestly, with audiences. I think we're all just so hungry for some connection, you know, and in this role in particular, and in this play in particular, the scene partner is the audience because the character of Heidi is 90% of really the dialogue and it's in relation and in direct address to an audience. So of course, um, what the constitution means to me speaks about how the constitution has essentially failed women. What about the script and about the role really drew you to it? Well, I saw it at New York Theater Workshop with Heidi. I just felt all the feels while I was watching it. I mean, she was soaring on that stage and women were soaring and and I felt it deeply. The production does, it executes so well the invitation of the piece, which is examining or re-examining your personal relationship to the constitution or legislation or law, government, your relationship at, to yourself as an American. Mm -hmm. And you get to do it intimately in your brain and in your heart, sitting in that theater in commune with other people. It invites you with the debate aspect of it to take the other side for a second in your mind and think about it from a different point of view and maybe even argue it, just try it on and see. And so what I love about the play is it's not preachy or pandering um, and it's not a challenge. I think it really is an invitation to see things differently. Were there things that you learned in this role, reading the script, playing um, this role, that you were like, wait, I had no idea that this was in the Constitution? Oh yeah, like a lot of it. <laughs> and like I said, when I was watching Heidi perform it, I was like, what? You know, she would move on and I had some thoughts where I was, I was still, you know, a minute behind her thinking through what she had said. I think one of the things that she really does well to point out is that it is a living, breathing document. Yeah. And and that it isn't something, it's not a museum piece. We get to be in relationship with it. And so learning about it and learning new things about it, and then also maybe even re-examining the things you thought you knew, we don't know what we don't know. Of course, a lot of the times Broadway audiences are men. Why should they go and see this show? What about this show do you think will speak to them um, and maybe have them ruminate on some of these issues or things once they leave. It's eye-opening for men who may think we've gotten a certain place or equality has been reached and um, they maybe think their own behavior or complicity or complacency around these issues. They might, you know, re-examine some of those and hearing from a woman, mm -hmm. not just her story, but the lineage of her story and how it has affected her. And it's, it's just on a human level, if you're a human being, yeah. it's relatable. There are so many little moments that I've missed. You know, I've missed the, the logistical aspects of theater, of I, I've missed the quick changes, I miss the, exhaustion in the best way but you know I think for me one of the most iconic moments is when she discovers her voice for the first time and that's the rain in Spain it's such a joyous song and they're dancing they've discovered you know her new power I think of her voice as her superpower and then that leads us into I could have danced all night so that little that beautiful little vignette is just perfect I have to say the most exciting moment was our table read. Just because we're all, it was our first moment all in a room together, rediscovering the story, and there's so many nuances that I don't think we would have discovered prior to March of 2020. We've all changed, you know? Um, and so the story has changed for us. And 
When I sang I Could Have Danced All Night and I hit that last note, it was like a release. I mean, I, I can't, I was just bawling in tears just to be able to sing that song again um, with my fellow company members is really special. To be able to return to the stage at this time with this story, a story of resilience and ambition, um, it's like, it's a gift. Come see us, we've been waiting for you, we're here to welcome you and, and invite you back into the theater and share in this beautiful art. This is the Broadway show and we're back in just a few. And that's going to do it for us. Until next time, I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is The Broadway Show.